October the 7th. It's not the day that the clock started on what we often euphemistically call the Israel-Palestine conflict, but it is the moment, of course, that the current horror began. That was the day when Hamas and other armed groups broke through the fence separating Gaza and Israel, committing atrocities which the Israeli state used to justify what many of us consider to be genocide against the Palestinian people of Gaza. Tens of thousands of Palestinians killed, including over 14,000 children, mass displacement of virtually the entire population, the mass destruction of civilian infrastructure, the violent dismantling of the health system, growing famine, we could go on. But what's true about that day itself and what's false? Now, we're approaching six months since that fateful morning and a really brilliant and important new documentary about Al Jazeera investigations seeks to finally establish the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, I've watched it and it is chilling. It's a brilliant piece of journalism, but it is chilling. And it's chilling in part because of the atrocities which were committed against unarmed and innocent Israeli civilians on the 7th of October. And it's chilling because of the false claims which were used in order to justify the mass slaughter of the Palestinian people in Gaza, which is ongoing. Now, I'm going to interview the top journalist, Richard Sanders, who's done so much work, of course, on this crucial piece of investigative journalism. A little note first, back in late November, I recorded a video which was posted on my YouTube channel and on other platforms. Following a screening I watched uh, hosted by the Israeli Defence Forces in central London, it was a compilation of atrocities committed by Hamas and other armed groups. Real, terrible atrocities. Now, that video caused huge controversy, to say the least, and indeed a firestorm of smears, lies, and really disturbing false claims about what I'd actually said, which appeared in multiple media outlets and all over social media. What I made clear from the beginning was that Hamas had committed serious and grave war crimes on the 7th of October, which I have seen too much evidence for with my own eyes, which nobody should be any doubt about. I also said that in some cases, the actions of the Israeli military were responsible for some of those civilian casualties, but that the evidence was that overwhelmingly it was Hamas militants responsible for the large majority of civilian deaths and that most of those killed on 7th of October were civilians. And of course, civilians were also taken hostage in large numbers. That itself is a grave war crime. I also said that notwithstanding the terrible atrocities which were committed by Hamas militants, some of the most extreme claims, which actually often received the most attention, which were then used to justify the mass slaughter of the Palestinian people, the most notorious claim, but not the only such claim, probably being the beheading of babies, were not justified by the evidence provided. Let's just see a clip from the documentary related to that. Hamas fighters and others committed crimes on October 7. The Israeli media, however, focuses not on the crimes they committed, but on crimes they did not. I'm talking to some of the soldiers and they say what they've witnessed as they've been walking through these different houses, these different communities, uh, babies, their heads cut off. That's what they said. No one could expect that it would be like this. The horrors that I'm hearing from these these soldiers, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, about 40 babies, at least, were, were taken out on gurneys. The eye unit's list of the dead shows no babies were killed in Kafar Azza, the kibbutz this report came from. The story was nevertheless picked up by international media and repeated by President Biden. I've been doing this a long time. I never really thought that I would see and have confirmed pictures of terrorists beheading children. Now, what I would say, having watched this brilliant documentary, obviously with far, far more work and evidence and skill, clearly involved than what I spoke about in my video in response to the IDF screening, what I said in that video is entirely justified by what Al Jazeera has uncovered. And I think I would say to those critics who did respond that they should watch this documentary and they will see that what I said is entirely justified by the evidence. Before I start the interview, my academic training was history. And based on that, I know it's so important we understand why events, however horrible, happened, what exactly happened in the events, and what those events then led to. It's often very difficult at the time to do that. 
not least when there's so much human suffering, so much pain and raw emotion involved. And when you have an ongoing conflict in which propaganda seeks to erase truth and state actors and their allies seek to, seek to stifle critical voices and to marshal evidence, real or otherwise, to support a military onslaught. It's still important we try. It isn't easy. But this documentary, I think, really does come the closest to knowing exactly what happened that day. Um, and as we see the mass slaughter of the Palestinian people, we do need to know exactly what happened on that terrible day, and which I've said terrible war crimes were committed, which does not justify in any way the mass slaughter which has since taken place any more than the atrocities against Hutus in Rwanda in the 1990s or in the same decade against Serbs in Bosnia justified genocides there. Now... Let's go talk to the great Richard Sanders. Um, Richard, I watched it um, and yeah, I mean, it was chilling. It was really w very well put together, by the way. Brilliant work, um, as you would expect from you and your team. Um, and it was chilling for lots and lots of lots of different reasons. I just want to start because what you do is you look in this and it's very, you know, there's it's it's very, very well evidenced and sourced. Um, and it paints a very clear picture that uh, atrocities were committed on the 7th of October but some of the more high profile or the most high profile examples didn't actually happen. And in fact, I was quite struck by one of the, in the, in the commentary when, when it was pointed out that, um, that, that actually there were crimes committed, but the media ended up focusing on crimes that weren't committed. So firstly, I just want to ask, what's the purpose of doing this? Some would say, well, look, why do you need to, why do we need to get bogged down in this? Atrocities, we know were committed. You say that in the film. War crimes were definitely committed, and you see them. I've seen them with my own eyes. What's the what's why what's the purpose journalistically? I suppose of 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 knowing um, of of saying this happened, but this didn't happen. Why why is that important? Because of everything that has happened since, um, in the wake of uh, October the seventh, and as a result of October the seventh, the Israelis have launched this bombardment and subsequently a ground invasion of the Gaza Strip, um, which, as you say, has cost at, at this stage over thirty-one thousand lives, almost half of them children. It's an appalling cost, and so we we need to get what happened on October the seventh right because it's being used as justification for this, and it will reverberate for decades to come as well. Now. If you look, whenever the Israelis or their their supporters in the West are challenged about these appalling death tolls and so on, um, they talk about babies and they talk about rapes. Um, it, it's used again and again to to signify something that what happened on October the seventh was so appalling that the people who committed it have effectively abdicated their right to expect to be treated as human beings. Uh, and then, you know, there's a long tradition of this. So you, you, you can go back to the way Native Americans were exterminated in the 19th century, the Indian mutiny, as we, we still call it, uh, the same thing, whereby the, the atrocities supposedly committed by those rising up are, are portrayed in the worst possible light. And it's always the same. It's always babies. It's always, and rapes. It's always those two things. And so, it's not just nitpicking. It's not just saying, oh, well, people were killed in this way, not that way. Those specific things were used and are used for a reason uh, to justify what has subsequently happened. And therefore, it's really important to put under the microscope whether they did actually happen or not. Um, so it was clear before we just discussed some of that, that war crimes were committed by Hamas right. and other armed groups and individuals because actually there was quite a lot of chaos. The fence came down and basically anyone who wanted to leave that fence at that point could leave. So it's actually not entirely clear often who we're even talking about or looking at. Um, and I suppose, I mean, we, we see, for example, at the music festival, the Nova Music Festival, which became, I, I suppose, the, the most striking horror of that day. Uh, for for lots of obvious reasons, lots of generally younger people partying and then then suffering horrible violent deaths, um, and you do see clearly atrocities there committed. I mean, just the fact, for example, you know, for shooting at Port you know, that that's they don't, they don't you know, I mean, or or for example, you know, um, uh, trying to hide in a bomb shelter and then throwing grenades in, and so you can see these atrocities. You can see them shooting at people in kibbutzim, um, and it also paints a picture of total chaos. That you know they didn't. They were kind of victims of their own success in that they didn't think they would be able to push in so far. And they didn't seem to have a strategy, so they ended up in Kibbutzim, and it wasn't actually clear even what they're trying to do. So, what did we learn from that? The kind of approach, you know, the the actual war crimes that committed, and what that said about the the kind of military strategy, I suppose, of that day. 
Yes, I mean, we focus quite a bit on these bomb shelters along the main highway. Um, all Israeli bus stops have a little bomb shelter next to them in case there's a, a missile alert. And it's actually very instructive, that, that story, because what you have is people fleeing at the music festival um, take shelter in these bomb shelters. So that's about 100 people in all in the four bomb shelters. Now, it's clear that the main aim of the day is to take hostages. They, they, they want to overrun these military bases, but that aside, uh, the main aim of the day is to take hostages. Now, you're right, uh, Hamas is clearly surprised by their own success, as everyone is. Uh, you know, the collapse, the, the, the intelligence failure combined with the collapse of the um, Israeli military is extraordinary. It is astonishing, unprecedented, which is what has given rise to one or two conspiracy theories about why that, that should have happened. Um, but so they, 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 they find themselves suddenly in this position where they have huge numbers of civilians at their mercy. Uh, and at that point, they're rather taken by surprise. At that point, everything is going to depend on the caliber of the sort of low, low ground level military leadership of Hamas. And that's what they're clearly found wanting. It becomes chaotic. They're not imposing discipline. In fact, as far as I can see, they're, they're joining in in the committing of atrocities. So these, these four bomb shelters, given that what they're fundamentally trying to do is to get hostages, this is a godsend to them. These people have effectively handed themselves to them. These bomb shelters don't have doors on them. Um, there they are. They're rounded up. They can just take them out and take them. And 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 they don't. They they just stand outside lobbing hand grenades in. And it's you know it goes on for longer than we show in the film. It's appalling to watch, and you can hear the screams of people inside. It's it, 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 it's dreadful to watch, and it really is indicative of. Uh, you know, well, uh, an entirely unacceptable way of behaving. You know, we're saying they 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 didn't kill kill slaughter and mutilate babies. They didn't um, commit widespread and systematic rape, but they they did some dreadful things, uh, and, and that's clearly true. Um, but it, success exposed Hamas's limitations as a military movement. I mean, yeah, just I mean, in in, in terms of on that. I mean, one of the things I, I did a video, some might be aware of, in response to I saw the IDF screening of um, which compiled various um, horrors of the day of seventh of October, and and one of the, the points I suppose I raised was um, in terms of just how disorderly it was um, that you did have some evidence. So I heard, for example, um, Hamas militants want some yelling at the Nova Festival, save the bullets for the soldiers. So there was some attempt at demarcation, but with others there wasn't. I mean, do you think that's reasonable? Do you think some basically their strategy was basically if we come across civilians, we can use them as hostages um, and we're going to kill soldiers? Um, and while others were just their their perspective basically was civilians were fair game as well and so it was kind of there wasn't just one clear approach there was lots of different ones which which varied depending on who who the individual was really i hadn't heard that specifically and that would be interesting if that was the case um i i think a lot certainly of the kibbutzes uh, uh, your fate a lot depended on who the bloke was who walked in the front door uh you know because it was chaotic uh, the, the the fact of the matter is that young men with guns given a license to commit violence tend to behave very badly the norm is they're going to behave very badly they need to be constrained by good platoon level company level leadership and that was not there um so i mean on the whole if you actually look at what they're doing the the music festival is a wild card they clearly hadn't anticipated the music festival and there wasn't a plan for it and their instinctive response seems to have been to simply shoot as many people as they could and um, what what they're doing and you can see this in the kibbutzes they they enter into environments and shoot anything that moves the yeah. passing cars they shoot at if they see yeah. somebody scuttling along a pathway they shoot at them they see a, a movement in a house they shoot shoot at that person once they have people in their power you know, sort of helpless in front of them, they generally take them hostage. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Not always, uh, you know, and I can certainly, uh, you know, think of instances where people are helpless in front of them uh, and, and they kill them. Um, so, yes, you're right. To a degree, it's left to the initiative of, of individuals hmm. um, at that point. But on the whole, the, the prevailing ethos is extraordinarily cavalier towards um, civilian life. I think it's a, it's a really important point to make. And as, as I said, having seen much of the uh, original footage, more footage of horror than I care really to uh, to have preferred to have watched. But yeah, it's it's clear that's that's definitely what, what happened. Now, there were certain claims made that day which were false. And I think we just need to just talk about that. Now, one of the most, I think, notorious example is beheaded babies. 
And clearly that is going to have the most visceral impact on people imaginable. The idea of beheading a baby is probably the most disturbed thing anyone could probably think of. I don't think there's anything worse than that really, is there? So that was repeated by Joe Biden using the bully pulpit of the US presidency, wasn't it? Days after it happened. And it was, you know, clearly when the onslaught and given within five days, more Palestinians had been killed than Israelis killed on the 7th of October. It was used, basically, every time anyone had any kind of qualms or problems with what was happening, it would be, well, these people beheaded babies. I mean, that's clearly what happened. So just can we just talk about this question of beheaded babies? Because to be clear, 36 children died, were killed on the, on the 7th of October, which is bad enough on its own terms. Um, one baby was killed, shot through a safe door, but also a pregnant woman um, was shot and had a cesarean and that her unborn baby was killed as well. There were no beheaded babies. So can you just talk us through what the hell happened with that and what, how, you know, what that claim was, what, what that claim meant really? Uh, yes, I mean, you can see why rumours perhaps are flying around. People also are aware of the, the use that can be made of these stories, but almost immediately extraordinary stories start to be told about babies. And and this is very simple in a way, because we have the list of the dead. We spent a lot of time. It was very complicated and dif difficult to do. We spent a lot of time drawing up a very comprehensive list of the dead. And as you say, there are two babies um, killed on October 7th, appalling, a, a child, eight-month-old child who dies when a bullet is fired through the door of a safe room, another baby who dies after an emergency uh, caesarean. But that's it. There are no other babies. Those two babies are not beheaded or, or burned or anything like that. Or put in an oven. That was another one. Yes, yeah, so that's right. They're put in the oven. So, so basically, it's very simple. Whenever you hear people talking about the large-scale murder of babies, the mutilation of babies, you know it's not true. OK, you, you know, it's not true. And that's terribly important. And, and, and that began to seep out after a week or two. I, th I think a, a, an awareness began to seep into some parts of the press that some of these stories weren't reliable. I mean, the 40 babies, most of them beheaded, was sort of discredited pretty quickly. Um, now, but that was terribly important because that should have established a precedent whereby we thought, well, hang on, if Israeli officials, Israeli army officers and first responders are telling us something, we shouldn't take it on trust. But in fact, people did continue to take things on trust. And, and this has important implications for what, in a way, was the next wave of atrocity stories after the babies, which was rape and sexual violence. Before I come on to that, I mean, another really striking well in fact let's talk about zaka so zaka just so people are aware they're a kind of first responder jewish kind of religious jewish first responder service they, they've been involved in quite a lot of scandal over the last decades involving um serious allegations of um, involving well financial scandal but also sexual abuse um their late uh that was their late leader wasn't he who committed suicide um now, Zaka, um, people may have seen they did big press conferences and, and addressed journalists with often blood curdling examples of horrors and atrocities. Um, and the leader, Yossi Landau, you actually interviewed. Now, we saw him give some performances where he is overwhelmed, apparently, with emotion, deeply affected by horrors, unspeakable horrors that he has seen including, for example, families where their hands and, you know, they're tied, they're, they're with a family where they're tortured, the eyes gouged out of the father before the killed, the fingers chopped off of the boy before, you know, and then they're tortured horribly like that, and then they're all killed, and then they go and eat afterwards some, some food. That was then repeated by Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State. That didn't happen, did it? No, it's, it's simply untrue. Uh, and again, we, we know this because we can pick apart the, um, we can look through the list of the dead and there's simply no family that corresponds to that. I mean, you know, um, 13 children under the age of 12 die on, on October the 7th. Two of them are actually killed by the Israelis. So that, that leaves uh, leaves 11. And, you know, so you can look in detail at the, the circumstances of their deaths and none of them, none of them die in those circumstances. So yes, Zaka, specifically Yossi Landau, the southern commander of Zaka, are the, are the source of an awful lot of these stories early on. Uh, and 
ultra-Orthodox religious organization. It's a rather strange arrangement the Israelis have whereby they farm out the sort of collection of bodies, which is, which is partly to do with religious reasons uh, to an organization like this. So first of all, let's be fair to them. Um, they are amateurs, they're volunteers, they're not forensically trained. Um, you know, they, 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 they were not equipped to be commenting on the state of the bodies they found, but nevertheless did. And Zachary itself has eventually said, well, actually, you know, our, our, our volunteers are not trained. They're not trained in forensics. Um, why do they tell all these stories? Let's pick this apart. Um, first of all, to be fair to them, they're overwhelmed and they're traumatized. They're, they're just not yeah. set up for this. They, 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 whatever, you know, they have seen dreadful things and, and, and they're traumatized by it. I think possibly sometimes they were confused by what they're looking at. I mean, a body that has been violently killed, particularly if rocket propelled grenades are involved, is, is a dreadful sight. And you, 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 the imagination can fill in all, all sorts of things. Having said that, um, a number of the stories simply um, just have, seem to have no foundation in, in fact at all. And I think people can draw their own conclusions from that. Now, why they're doing this, we have in the film um, Netanyahu goes to visit them and he thanks them for talking to the press and for the stories they're telling to the, to, to the world's press. And it's quite explicit. He says, you know, this is another front in, in the war. We, the, 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 um, the, the sort of information war is a part of the war. He, he's quite explicit about it. Well, he says that you influence public opinion in the West and that public opinion then has a pressure on the leaders of yeah. those in the West. Yeah. And we know from other quotes, Benjamin Netanyahu is actually very concerned about, he's, he expressed concerns apparently about demonstrations, protests in the West. So he's very clear about the role of Western public opinion because the West arms and supports Israel. Yeah. So his point to them was actually, you're playing a key role because you're influencing public opinion and we need to keep public opinion on our side. And, and you do that by 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 bigging up the stories, by by doing rapes and doing babies and so on. We actually filmed Yossi doing a sort of talk to a group of female Americans um, who who were, were visiting Israel. And yes, I mean he has he he, he has he goes through a routine. He he does. He, and he, this was you know this was filmed in January. He was still telling all the same stories. And you can see the impact these women are putting their heads in their hands. And you know. Um, you, you can see the impact it has. I mean, as you say, this was also an organisa organization in crisis, um, allegations of child sexual abuse, um, financial crisis, financial irregularities, it, and it, it depends entirely on voluntary contributions, and um, its financial problems have disappeared since October mm. Well, I noted the other day, I uh, noted that Elon Levy, the Israeli government spokesperson, has been using Cameo, uh, which is um, where people can record videos for fans in, for, in exchange for money. Um, and he defended himself by pointing out that well, he was raising money for Zaka. Um, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, I, I, I think the people who are really culpable, well, politicians regurgitate it. It's not surprising that is, Israeli politicians regurgitate it. It's disgraceful when Western politicians start to just regurgitate this stuff without question, but they do. And British politicians have a lot. British politicians of both political parties. Including David Lammy, Shadow Foreign Secretary, who's in the film. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, and, and, you know, again, as I say, every time you watch them, every time the conversation is about a ceasefire and, and the scale of the civilian casualties, mm. they will talk about babies and they will talk about rapes. Every every single time. Now the media, to, to a degree, the media initially. I mean, you know, you're you're at a site where clearly large numbers of people have been killed. This is the poor fellow who's had to pick up the bodies. Why wouldn't you believe him? You know, if, you know, in, in normal circumstances, you would. I think with the passage of time, and particularly once the forty baby story begun to unravel, greater scepticism should, should have kicked in, and it, and it didn't. Uh, and, and particularly, again, we'll go on to this, the sexual violence. Um, while scepticism began to kick, kick in about beheaded babies, it doesn't seem to have kicked in about the sexual violence. Before we talk about sexual violence, um, there was a story which was popularised by um, uh, by Zaka, and you interview Yossi, Yossi Lander about this, and I'm slightly bemused about why he agreed to be interviewed given his performance here. A hideous story about a pregnant woman. It is not the only questionable story that Yossi Landau tells about Kibbutz Beri. We go further. <sighs> then we see a woman. She was lying on the floor, a puddle of blood, big puddle of blood. She was a pregnant woman. Her stomach was butchered open. 
The baby that was connected to the cord was stabbed, and she was shot in the back. Kibbutz Berry has denied this account. The story of the pregnant woman reported by Zaka is not relevant to Berry. And um, that story is believed to have happened at the Shabrin Shatia massacre, where the Falange, a Israel-backed uh, paramilitary force, conducted a hideous massacre for which Ariel Sharon, then in the Israeli, at the IDF, then became Israeli prime minister, was held culpable for by an Israeli commission. Um, now, there's no evidence for that happening, is there? And what I found astonishing is he tried to show you a photo to prove it had happened, but the photo didn't prove anything of the sort. Yes, I mean, psychologically, uh, people more qualified than myself would have to, to try and pick this apart. Um, why he offered to show me a photo that he didn't have uh, seems very strange. I know, there you go. But but going back, yes, and, and that horrific scene didn't didn't happen. And, and reportedly, it supposedly did, Sabra and Shatila. I mean, you know, the, it's perhaps a slightly controversial thing to say this, but this is a thing Palestinians would say, and I think there's some logic to this. Um, if you actually listen to... Israeli descriptions of what happens on October the 7th. They're not actually describing what happened on October the 7th. They're describing what happened at, at Sabra and Shetila. Um, sexual violence. Now, obviously, something very difficult to talk about. Um, now, I thought a really brilliant interviewee was Madeleine Reese, OBE. She's a British lawyer, current Secretary General of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I believe that there was rape. Really in every conflict, whenever there are men with guns intent on perpetrating violence, it is highly unlikely there will not be sexual violence. But nothing that I've seen put forward so far suggests that it was widespread and systematic. It's a very high bar to actually reach. We know war crimes and atrocities were committed on the 7th of October, and therefore, you know, it's so we're not saying this is not to say this did not happen. That's not the argument being made here at all. There is the, the argument was made about syst systematic rape, that that was used as a strategy, deliberate strategy by specifically Hamas. Yeah. So so with rape and sexual violence, yes, yeah, so the basic point we're making in the film is that they you, you simply cannot argue that there, it was widespread and systematic. Systematic is terribly important because the idea is that it's deliberately instrumentalized by, by Hamas as a weapon of war. And there simply isn't the evidence for this. As you say, terribly important to say, we're not saying there were no rapes at all. There may have been. Um, but, but that it was widespread and systematic, there simply isn't the evidence for. Um, when you actually boil it down, uh, and the, the UN report that came out a little while back essentially did this as well. When you boil it down, the rep that reporting, the New York Times, the BBC and the Guardian, who have all done big exposés, investigations into this, they all essentially rely on Israeli officials, on army officials and on first responders. OK, we're in the same group of, of problematic um, witnesses who were discredited by the by the baby stuff okay so you have to put that aside and then look at the solid evidence so let's come back to firstly the visual evidence you know i've watched uh, almost seven hours of footage from october the 7th um and there is nothing in it um that would indicate that there are no instances of sexual violence in, in the footage I have, have witnessed. You then have huge numbers of post-mortem videos uh, and photos, which again, I mean, you will see women who have blood on their trousers and so on. I mean, you, you know, that, that really isn't evidence. So the, the, the one image that I took particularly seriously um, was an image of a young woman um, who, who was photographed, her body was photographed, She's lying next to her car, which is next to the main highway, um, about nine miles north of, of, of the festival site, the music festival site. It's a particularly tragic death. She, they'd clearly left the music festival very early, her and her husband, and um, they'd almost made it. Uh, you know, they, 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 she dies at about uh, just before seven, I, I think, and had they got there a minute earlier, they they, they run straight into the very first Hamas yes, yes. Um, fighters arriving at, at that kibbutz there. Now. Basically, her, her the, the the footage of her her body. It's clear she's she's not wearing underwear, uh, and, and that's what seems significant there. The New York Times made it the centerpiece of their story. It's that it, it, they they have a picture of the family, and about a third of the article relates to this. And almost immediately afterwards, the sister came out on Instagram and said, 
No, she wasn't raped. We know she wasn't raped. Um, basically, she was in touch with the family. She texted just a few minutes before she died, and there was no mention of rape at that point. In fact, at that point, you know, they 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 weren't in trouble at that point. They were hoping to to get out of there. Yeah. Um, then, at, after she's shot, the husband is on the phone to his brother, and I think he's on the phone for forty four minutes. Um, and again, no mention of rape. So, you know, I think it's pretty clear that that, which was the most compelling visual evidence there was, was not evidence that that, that that was not the, the case now if we, we take that un report from a couple of weeks ago it talks a lot about young women tied to trees or to posts with the the lower part of their clothing mm -hmm. removed now that certainly would you know be be indicative that something disturbing might have happened but again i've just not seen any images I, as far as i can see there are no images to support this um the, the sexual mutilation of bodies i've seen no images to support this again it was interesting that un report a couple of weeks ago said that, that there's nothing to support the idea that there is a pattern of the sexual mutilation of, of bodies so you know, and, and, and it, the, the, there's a problem that there are so few witnesses. There's no, there's no forensics at all. That might be the chaos of the day. It's startling how few witnesses there are. The music festival is an open site. Thousands of people survive the massacre at the, at the music festival. And to have effectively two witnesses, I mean, one or two others have spoken to journalists or individual journalists, but to effectively only have two witnesses is strange. I mean, I know... People are traumatized sometimes. People don't speak for some time, sometimes mm -hmm. years afterwards. And I understand all of that. But, but it's odd. You would think there would be more than two witnesses coming forward. The, the fact that there are, there are no victims, of course, uh, at all. Uh, again, that may be because they're, they're, you know, they were killed. Um, but the, the, the paucity, the lack of witnesses is strange. Before I just finally ask about in terms of those killed by um by the Israeli military, and we'll talk, just talk about that. I mean, the, the point made by my near namesake, Mark Owen Jones, who's a academic researcher uh, who I've interviewed myself, um, is, you know, why these stories? And the point he made, which I thought was very astute, was if the Israeli state is killing far, 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 far more Palestinians, which it has, I mean, both in absolute numbers and proportionately, the number of October 7th, is that Gaza has now suffered is obviously in, uh, huge. So then a distinction has to be made. We might be killing more, but their killings are depraved. That's what makes it, that. that's why we're morally superior. So we retain moral superiority, even though there's far more, oh, so, you know, over 14,000 Palestinian children have been killed. And that point you made about the set, you know, if we talk about that baby being shot through the safe, uh, the door of a safe room, horrible. That's not morally different, is it? from Israel, they could go, well, we're not deliberate, we're not trying to kill um, Palestinian kids. Well, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're just carpet bombing a Gaza, you're going to do that, aren't you, as we've seen. But that's the point, isn't it, is to go, well, actually, they intentionally killed babies and children in a sadistic fashion, because they are, they, you know, they're, and that's, and that's, they're, they're animals. And that's why that justifies what we're doing. And that's why we're morally superior. That's the point. Yes. Isn't it? it dehumanizes. There's a sort of specific switch in, in the brain. Once people have become savages, which is the word Marco Rubio actually uses in our film, then they can't expect the same treatment. And we emotionally feel differently about their deaths. Once once you have people have moved into the category of sav savages and barbarians, then then um it matters less. And that's why specifically there is such a focus on these, these depraved crimes of, of, of rape uh, and, and babies. Finally, in terms of um, we, the, what there's a bit of, there's a lot of discussion about the Hannibal directive, um, which for those who don't know, because uh, an Israeli soldier was taken hostage um, a long time ago by Hamas, kept for years, and huge numbers of Palestinian prisoners were released as a consequence, which seemed humiliation. So then the argument was, well, if they try and keep take a, a soldier hostage, it's better that, that, that they're killed rather than taken captive. Um, and the question is whether that was then applied to the question of civilian hostages on that day. Um, and you interview various military analysts who are actually disturbed by the footage of helicopters firing um, on you know, without knowing what the targets are. So can we just talk through, I mean, at the festival, what what, what do we know at the festival about that? Well, uh, no, I, I think uh, the Hannibal Directive, uh, if it applies, it, it's to do with Apache helicopters, and it's also within the kibbutzes. I mean, it, 
uh, there, there's you, you always get these strange things going on, on 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 social media. There was one particular post which pointed people towards the festival as the site of uh, um, the sort of friendly fire deaths. And actually, I, I'm not really seeing um, evidence there. I think it, I think it would be else elsewhere. But basically, what you have is the Hannibal Directive actually goes all the way back to the 80s. And as you say, the, it was a view that you know better you kill everyone than let somebody be taken back as as hostage because then they've got us you know they, they can use it as a bargaining chip and so on it was supposedly rescinded a few years ago but the reporting specifically from the israeli newspaper um yediot aronot um was that it was it was revived on october the 7th specifically at midday a, a version of the hannibal directive was issued now the israeli army has not denied this it certainly hasn't confirmed it but it has, has not denied this and the, the the visual evidence would seem to us to support it so two aspects to this firstly the apache helicopters the israelis released enormous quantities of, of gun camera footage and you can just look at it they you, you you look at the footage and particularly when they're shooting vehicles they can't possibly know who they're shooting and we you know we geolocated a lot of this imagery and uh, you know a lot of these cars and people are moving west they're heading towards the gaza strip they're coming from the settlements so you know they can't possibly have known that these these cars and these groups of people didn't include hostages now we know from an eyewitness there is certainly one person who was killed by a helicopter we think the number is quite a bit higher than that um here in analyzing deaths you run into the problems of the complete chaos and also the amateurishness of zaka that the work the proper work of, of documenting where bodies were found, what state they were found in, and so on, was not simply wasn't done. So we're always struggling a little bit here. But we have identified 27 people who were clearly taken hostage, taken away from their homes, mm -hmm. um, but were dead before they got to the fence. And we simply don't know how they died. I think there's a fair chance that a number of them were, were killed by Apache helicopters. We wouldn't know about it because they're dead. And, and everyone who was with them was dead. Very interesting thing Yossi Landau told me. It's not in the film, this, but. Um, Zaka were asked to collect the Palestinian bodies as well, which they did. Um, and after a while, 21 of them were sent back. They, they, they said, no, hang on, these aren't Palestinians, these are Israelis, which begs the question of why they were mistaken for Israelis in the first place. And logic would say it's because they were found in the open country towards the fence, surrounded by other Palestinians. Logic would suggest there. So I'm, I'm very much back, of, you know, this is very much a guess probably somewhere in the 20s, uh, you know, teens, 20s, uh, people killed by Apache helicopters. But quite important that because you also you do see stuff on social media that the majority of people were killed. Um, yeah, on, that wasn't the case. Which is, you know, there's just no evidence for that whatsoever. You then come into the kibbutzes where ground troops also appear to have been extremely aggressive in the way they retook kibbutz mm. like Berdi and, and, and Kafar Aza. I mean, it, it's actually very interesting. You watch the raw footage of journalists being shown around these kibbutzim in the days afterwards. And a lot of them are saying, you, you can sort of hear them chatting to their sort of military minders and so on, saying, well, hang on, that, that house is completely destroyed. Well, you know, because the Hamas come across the border with sidearms and, and, and with rocket propelled grenades. They also burn houses, you know, so that's that's quite important you, you, because they're trying to smoke people out of their safe rooms. So you see a house destroyed by fire. That quite possibly is Hamas. But a lot of those houses, and we showed this in the film, are clearly simply dis destroyed by heavy heavy weaponry. So that's when you see from the top, like their roofs are missing and all the rest of it. That's from... Well, well that can be fire that? damage. That can be fire damage. And I don't think the Apache helicopters were firing within the kibbutzes. It, it's right, tanks okay. and so on. That we're, we're, we're dealing with it. On the whole, I don't think they were anyway. It, it's tanks. I mean, the, the incident we we tell at Berry, uh, where there are 12 people who are pretty clearly killed by um, the Israeli forces when they retake this house, which actually is interesting because it's the house um, that senior officials and, and Yossi Landau then talk about as having been yeah. full of babies or children. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, not only, only was it not full of babies or, or children, but in fact, the, the people there um were, were, were killed by the uh, israeli military there there are six others we we've identified who who are are clearly killed by the israeli forces as they come in again i suspect the real figure may be higher um you you often see pictures of people who are being sort of dug out from the the rubble um and we you just don't know how they died obviously they 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 were, they were dead once the house fell on them whether they were dead already we 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 just don't know so again i you know i think we've got a figure of 18 killed by ground troops i suspect it'll be rather higher but again not as high as some of the speculation you see no. in social 
media. A large majority of those killed, including the civilians, were killed not. They were killed by Hamas or other armed groups. Yeah, yes, by Hamas and others who came through the fence. You know, at the very least, ninety percent of the of the, of the people who are killed, of, of the civilians who are killed, are, are killed by Hamas and others. At the very least, ninety percent. I think that's important to say, just because I think often when I post about this, people do suggest. I, I just see your comments. People say say it's a lot higher. <laughs> Um, I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, there, is, there isn't the evidence for that. And even yeah. if we start to, to include those deaths where it's questionable and so on, you 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 still don't get into anything like the sort of numbers some people are talking about. Just finally, then, I mean, as we've, we've seen now, the horror unleashed against Gaza. Um, and I mean, we don't actually know the actual death toll because we have the official death toll, which doesn't include those thousands buried under the rubble. And there are also people... Think like you could just pluck out of random someone with cancer who's not getting medical care. I mean, it's just endless. And the these one projection is that in terms of excess deaths, if, for example, Rafa is invaded, um, then by August, over 5% of Gaza's population will have been killed. So we're talking about a truly, I mean, just by historic standards, that's a that's one of the great killing killings of our time, killing speeds of our time. Um 7th of October, as we've established, atrocities were clearly committed and that's that's absolutely true um but he's equally false claims were made in order to justify what happened next that's that's clearly what happened do you think we'll ever have a proper understanding of what happened on 7th of october or do you think well, a lot of this well, I, I think we're fairly fairly close to it yeah, i mean you, close, you'll, yeah. you'll never have a, you'll never have an absolutely definitive totting up of the, the bodies and so on and i think this is um a huge frustration for the relatives of those who died and there's a those 27 people, for example, we, we identify, I think their families are enormously frustrated as well by the fact that they don't know what happened and it's very distressing for them. So I think, you know, the the inadequacy of Zaka and also the fact that it was overwhelmed and, and the fact that bodies were not properly collected and registered and so on means we'll never have a precise reckoning. But I think we, in our film, I think we've got, a, you know, a fairly good broad reckoning of what happened. Yeah. Uh, and it, and it comes across, I should be clear, that's very clear that comes across like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's appalling. It's appalling what happened. Um, but, you know, as I say, some of the things that are claimed didn't happen. And it's quite important because those those are the things that are used to, to justify what then happened subsequently. Well, it's a, a brilliant piece of journalistic work. And again, also, you know, my training was as historian and it is important that we understand accurately what happens for our history. Um, and this is, I think, a crucial contribution to what will be, you know, the, the, the picture of what happened that day and what's happened since. So the link for that is in the video description. So make sure you uh, watch it and you share it. Um, please like this video and to subscribe, do share the video. But Richard, thank you so, so much. Brilliant. Thank you very much.